Meeting number 220405, meeting of the Town Council of Cape Elizabeth. Could we have the roll call by the Town Clerk, please? Chairman Swift Kayata. Here. Councilor Backer. Here. Councilor Fritz. Here. Councilor Lynch. Here. Councilor McKenney. Here. Councilor Moles. Here. And Councilor Roberts. Here. And the Town Manager. Here. And the Town Clerk. Here. Okay, thank you. It's time for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, I'm going to move down to the podium on the side because we have a presentation from uh, Clint Blood, president of the Cape Elizabeth, I'm sorry, of the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. And as you mentioned, I'm president of the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation, and it's our pleasure tonight to uh, give a gift to the town. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Glenn Israel, uh, the chairman of the second annual appeal and the vice president of the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, I have two checks to present to the, uh, to the town this evening. Uh, the first check is for $9,500, and it represents uh, half of the proceeds of the annual appeal for 2005, which is our second annual appeal. The other half of the proceeds have been deposited in the endowment fund that we created for the fort. And the second check is for $810, which represents the amount of the endowment fund that's been dispersed for this year according to the spending policy. Okay. As the endowment fund gets bigger, that check will hopefully get bigger as well. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you on behalf of the town. I would like to add the Town Council's appreciation to the Foundation and to the citizens of Cape Elizabeth, and probably there are some other people who aren't residents of Cape Elizabeth, who have made donations um, to benefit Fort Williams Park. And before I lose these, I'm handing these two checks to the town clerk so that she's now responsible for them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have a number of things on our agenda tonight that were put on the table at our last meeting. The first one is item number Mi minutes. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Reports and correspondence. Oh, how about minutes? Minutes. Steered me wrong. Minutes. Do I hear a motion? <laughs> uh, I'll move adoption of the minutes of our last meeting, Monday, June 13th, 2005. Second. Been moved and seconded. Are there any amendments or changes? I have, um, it's more in line of a question, on the second page of the minutes, under the town manager's report, it said copy attached to the minutes of the manager's report, yet I saw no copy attached to these. It will be to the it official. It will be to the official minutes, okay. And then um, on the third page on it must be item number 181. Um, the first motion moved by uh, Jack Roberts and seconded by Marianne Lynch ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council approve the proposed BA wetlands am amendment. Um, and then there was a tabling item. So was there was there a vote taken on that? I'm trying to reconstruct what happened. There was just no vote. There was a motion to table and that right. overtook it. Okay. That's right. I just wanted to clarify that. And I have one other question. Item number 192, a copy will be attached to the minutes. So, okay, great. Thank you. Any, anything else? All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Now, reports and correspondence. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It's been a, uh, a busy month, and uh, the Portland Symphony recently had their annual Fourth of July uh, event, and I think a number of councils went to that, and my wife and I were fortunate we could, go, could take that in this year as well. Uh, I did go to the COG meeting that was held, their annual meeting, with uh, Councilor Fritz, and 
We did receive one award for, um, let's see, which one was that one, Carol? Help me out. It was for the Fort Williams Playground. For the Playground, the playground Volunteers, the thank you. Yeah, so I definitely wanted to remember mentioning that. And I went to the PECS uh, annual meeting, that, uh, which was also held this past month, and uh, I know Bob Malley was there, Maureen O'Meara, the town manager, was the, one of the guest presenters. Um, so Cape Elizabeth was re represented at those meetings. Thank you very much. Anything else from other counselors? No, I would just like to take this opportunity to welcome Alan Hawkins, who is our new superintendent of schools, and he's here. We're going to be seeing him a little bit later tonight, but welcome. I know we all look forward to working with you. Um, town manager's report. No report. See, I'm trying to sort of bomb along because I know it's a warm evening, although it's not as hot in here as I thought it might be tonight. Citizens discussion of items not on the agenda. It's an opportunity for any citizen who wants to speak on any topic that is not on the agenda to come forward to the podium. Seeing no one standing up, I guess we're done with that. Now we get to the items on the table. Um, the first item that is on the table that uh, for us to deal with, we will have to have a motion to remove it from the table. It's item number 181-0405, which has to do with the BA wetlands amendment. Do I hear a motion? So moved. So second. It's been moved and seconded to remove it from the table. Uh, any, is there discussion on a removing from the table? No. All in favor of removing it? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five. Opposed? One. Abstention? One. Um, it's, so it's now on the table. Um, Councillor Backer, did you want to? Um, yeah, that? in keeping with um, this issue, each time it's come up, um, I'd like to recuse myself from discussion and consideration. I move Councillor Backer's recusal. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of accepting his offer to recuse himself? Six. Opposed? One. Okay. Councillor Backer, you could just step down to the audience, please. Okay. We um, had some discussion on this item last month. Do I hear a motion so that we can move forward with this item? I make a motion that we um, accept the BA Wetlands Amendment to change the, to reduce the setback from 250 feet to 100 feet for, in, for properties in the BA district. I'll second that. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Okay. Sorry. Marianne. This was tabled last month largely because of... Um, Councillor McKenney's tour of duty with the National Guard, and um, I know um, we thought that it was an important issue, and, and we knew that he wanted to participate in that, so we tabled it for that reason. But I would just uh, take a second to um, remind everyone for the record that this is a very, very small area of town. We're talking about just the BA business district. Um, the setback reduction does not apply if the wetland has either moderate or high value um, for wildlife. So it is a very um, constrained kind of reduction in the setback. If there is good value for wildlife, then it is not a 100-foot setback. It goes back to the 250 feet. Um, the main DEP has um, its own regulations are 100 feet um, setback. Um, so it's, it's not clear to me why we need to be 150% more restrictive than the DEP. And lastly, this only applies where um, there is um, access to town water and sewer. So um, I think it is very, very minimal um, environmental impact, if any, and perhaps um, would have a positive impact um, when it's applied for um, sewer and water. So, and, and lastly, the um, property owner who is interested um, and had requested this um, had come to us last month and showed us pictures of how she wants to clean up the area around her business. And I, I think we ought to um, be supportive of that kind of effort. So um, I support this motion. 
Thank you. Is there anyone? Councillor Fritz. Um, we had talked a little bit, uh, Councillor Swift Keata, that um, there might be some answers to questions from the town planner. I don't know whether you received any. Um, I did, and I, I can share those right now if you want. I asked, is that okay? Yeah, I didn't I mean like to cut that. you off. Yeah. Um, I had um, emailed the town planner, um, well, yesterday, but she wasn't here until today, um, some questions I had about this matter, um, and she is unable to be here tonight, but with, if that's okay, <clears throat> I'll just read you what her answers were. I had asked what, what has the Conservation Commission recommended or said about this issue? because there was a reference in the January 18th, 2005 planning board minutes to a memo from them. And that memo, I believe, was included in the material we just got for tonight, um, in case you haven't had a chance to read it. But basically, the, uh, Maureen's answer was, the Conservation Commission is opposed to the amendment. I will provide copies of their comments for tonight's meeting. The comments were provided in January. They specifically are concerned about one, the precedent of reducing wetland protections, two, the lack of compelling need identified, three, the opportunity for expansion under the current non-conforming regulations, and four, possible unintended consequences. Um, my second question was how many neighbors or abutters support the change and were they notified somewhere along the process? Uh, Maureen's answer was I haven't heard from any abutters who support the change, although they would benefit from it. Two abutters, Gail Schmader and the Bests, are opposed. Tom Bordeaux, I think I pronounced that right, who lives off Mitchell Road, also wrote in support. Because this is a text amendment and not a map amendment, individual notices are not required to be mailed to abutters. And then she goes on about where the legal ad was and that it was on the website. Um, I asked if the, how strong was the planning board's recommendation on this? Was it a strong recommendation or, you know? I asked her to characterize it. She said they recommended it by a vote of 6-0. Comments included support helping business only impacting a limited area, even though there was, there was a letter of opposition to the planning board. Um, I asked who in the process had spoken for or against this change. Um, she said Mary Page is the, the person who's petitioned for this, is the only supporter I've heard from. There is a letter from Tom Bordeaux in tonight's town council package, and I haven't seen that, but I assume it's there. Um, and then I just asked, there had been a reference in one citizen's email about um, something that happened on the other side of Route 77 when clearing was done on that property, and that was the property that was out behind St. Bartholomew's Church. I just asked what property she was referring to. So those are the answers to her questions. Would you like to go on, Councillor Fritz? Okay, yeah, great. Um, I. I was able to go to um, Mary Page's property and, and see um, just what was um, being thought about and get a feel for the, the lay of the land and where the land drops off. And um, it, it, it seems to me that some of the things that she might want to do could be done within the current ordinances. It also seemed when I looked at the map where the 250 line is and where the, um, the change would be, it looked as though a great deal of what, one, what she wanted to do was actually within the 100 feet anyway. So um, I'm concerned about changing and reducing the setback uh, and, and don't really favor that because it, it, I think it is a precedent setting um, issue. I don't think we should have wetlands ordinances that are different for businesses and, uh, and residences. And I think that if we do relax these ordinances um, for one property owner or for a group of property owners, then we will be asked to do the same sort of thing in the future. Um, I really think that this wetlands ordinance was developed over I think it took five years of study to get that ordinance in place and it was really done looking at nobody's property in particular it was done on a very nonpartisan kind of situation really looking scientifically at the types of soils the plants 
plant life um, and um, I think there are very many reasons for protecting the wetlands, particularly in the area of um, Great Pond, which I think is a very sensitive area in this town. It's a, it's a eutrophying uh, Great Pond and is very sensitive to any kind of um, runoff to it. Um, although this isn't absolutely directly into the pond, it, it is in the, in the vicinity and I'm sure eventually gets there very quickly. Um, and also, I think not um, interfering with the buffer and wetlands in the town is greatly impacts our flood control. Flood control is one of the main reasons that we protect our wetlands. And I mean, a, a, a spring like we've had this year shows you how, how much uh, can be accumulated in these wetlands and then they, they absorb. Um, primarily, I would be concerned if we change this wetlands ordinance in the business zone, we, it will spread to other parts of the town. And I think that would be a shame when we have a model ordinance that has been praised highly for what we have done in this town. Um, the other thing is that we really said when we started the comprehensive planning process that um, we would not change ordinances um, until we really finished that process, analyzed what we ought to be doing, and and um, make changes at that time. Thank you. Jack. Thank you. My concerns with changing it um, are quite similar to Carol's, but we know how many businesses we currently have down there now. What we don't know is how many would be allowed if the zone change was allowed. And could one single owner go in and buy the whole area? And if so, how much pavement are we talking? We don't, the problem that, as I see it is, we have no data, period, zero. There have been no studies done to define where the, where the wetlands drain, how large they are, what they're encroaching upon. We never, we never make changes without having somebody, either the, the applicant coming forward with that information for us, or the town spending its own money to, to, to learn that information before we make a decision. We simply don't know, at this point, what we're doing. We don't know the wetland boundaries, and we don't even know for sure which way they drain. I know part of it may drain towards Broad Cove, and part of it may drain towards Great Pond. And as Carol said, Great Pond is very fragile, and it is shrinking fast. We don't need a zone change for, any of the, for the business to connect to the sewer. They can, they can do that now. If they get a, a septic system that's not operating properly, and nobody's indicated that they have, but if they were to have a system that was starting to fail, they can connect to the sewer system as it now exists. They're, they're in that area. I'm, if I knew what we were getting into and what the real environmental impacts were going to be and that there was no harm being done by reducing it, I would be the first one to say, let's move it back so it's less restrictive. But again, we don't know. Until we get that information, I don't want to change what we have. Thank you. Councilor McKinney. Thank you. I'm in favor of the change because I think it's going to be better for the environment. Uh, right now, those businesses that we're talking about in the BA, BA wetlands, just so the, the citizens understand, we're talking about the uh, Two Lights General Store and beyond that, down to the Good Table Restaurant. Uh, currently, those businesses are on septic systems, and those septic systems have the potential they're out back and behind the buildings, and there's a lot of wastewater, and they are draining into, uh, if that's, that in, is indeed a wetland, that's where they're draining. That's more harmful to the environment than if they were on the sewer. If we do this change and a business requests the change, if they want to build in that area, they have to hook up to the public sewer. That's one of the requirements in this change. So in that sense, it would be better for the environment. Uh, secondly, if a business wants to make an expansion, they have to t go to the planning board. The planning board then has to look at that. 
They have to do a site survey. Therefore, all of that work will be done at that time. I don't think we can make or not make changes based on hypothetical unintended consequences because we're never going to know the future. We don't have a crystal ball. I think we have to use our best judgment and be as reasonable as possible. And I think this is a reasonable change that actually favors the environment and allows the businesses to operate in a, a less um, onerous fashion. We, we give them a little room to uh, grow and to operate in, in their environment. Councillor Moles. I support this amendment and have from day one. And, you know, uh, let's, let's quickly go over what we've heard tonight. Uh, that the Conservation Commission thinks it's a bad idea to go from 250 feet down to 100 feet, which is the state standard. Here we are in Cape Elizabeth, we're our own little island. You know, we have to be at 250 feet when the rest of the state is at 100. Well, a leopard can't change its spots, and I wouldn't expect anything other than that from the Conservation Commission. And, you know, the fact that a decade ago, someone spent five years studying this issue to expand the boundaries in Cape Elizabeth from 100 feet to 250 feet doesn't surprise me either, considering the power that the environmental lobby has had in this town for many years. We're talking about a very minute change that is obviously pro-business, but it's pro-environment. Those woods need to be cleaned up. Uh, the owner of the property has come to us and showed us exactly what she wants to do. I've gone down, I've looked at the problem, I agree with what she wants to do. Uh, there is an issue with septic in that area. If you go and, and visit the businesses in that area, there are days when you can really smell that septic, so I can tell you right now, it's leaking into the wetland. So this would be you know, a benefit to that. Um, and I don't really mean to disrespect the Conservation Commission, but they are what they are, and you wouldn't expect them to rule otherwise. So as far as their voice on that, I, you know, why even bother asking them? Because you know what they're going to say. The planning board, on the other hand, did vote 6-0 in favor of making this change. Uh, you know, if, if we had a town chamber of commerce and we asked them what we should do, well, obviously, th their viewpoint is going to be more pro-business. There, they would have said, you know, obviously, you know, it's, it's pretty much common sense going down and looking at the, the location. Should the buffer be moved from 250 feet to 100 feet town-wide? Yeah, I think it should. Uh, I agree with Jack that we shouldn't have one set of rules for business and then one set of rules for residences. I think we should conform to the state standard. I don't think we need to be exceeding the state standard here in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, Yes, Great Pond is a sense, has a very sensitive ecology, uh, but it's going through the natural cycle that any pond does. That pond has been silting in for years, and one morning we're going to wake up and there will be no more Great Pond. It'll be a large uh, field, and then 100 years after that, it'll be wooded woodland again. That's what ponds do. Um, and the fact that this was a... Well, I don't think I'll go there. So. Uh, I think I've already said enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Moles. Um, I, too, like several of the councillors, have been down to see the land. Um, Ms. Page was kind enough to show me around, and um, I understand the problem that she has there. Um, I'd like to say a few things. This has been a difficult one for me because the proponents and the opponents of, uh, on this issue have both made very good arguments and I think it's a close decision. It's been a close decision for me. Um, I think that to be pro-environment does not necessarily mean that you're anti-business and to be pro-business does not necessarily mean you're anti-environment. I don't think the two things are mutually exclusive so I'm not sure I buy into some of those arguments but I do think that the 250-foot boundary rule is based, was, has been based on citizen input during the last comprehensive plan. Um, and uh, it's what the citizens of Cape Elizabeth said at that point they were interested in, at least as is reflected in the plan. Um, I tried to consider the facts in this one, at the facts as I knew them. I've heard uh, from one person, the petitioner, um, in favor of this change. I have heard from six citizens um, 
I personally have heard from six citizens who are against this. The Conservation Commission has come out and said they are against it. I have heard no evidence that the neighbors, uh, the abutters, support it. Um, and I think I agree, I agree with Councillor Roberts that I think we do have some lack of information here. I'm concerned about unintended consequences when you make a wholesale change to a zone, even though that zone may be relatively small. Um, and I am mostly persuaded uh, by our own action of a few months ago, the Council's own action of a few months ago, when we said that we would hold off on making ordinance changes and zoning changes um, while the, con the new Comprehensive Plan Committee is working over the next 18 months to reflect the views of the community and the standards that they want. So I will be voting against this. I sympathize with Ms. Page, but um, I think those reasons and those facts overrule. So, thank you. Is there anything else that anyone else would like to say, or is there, shall we move the question? Just got one, one quick question. Um, should we disband the ordinance committee then for the rest of the year, actually the rest of the next five years while we wait for the new uh, study to be done? I, I'm just saying that part of your argument doesn't really hold any water. You don't have to, we'll, we're going to agree to disagree on this issue, but I mean, that's, that just doesn't hold any water, that we should just stop all town work while we're waiting for a group to study our comprehensive plan. Well, if I might respond, Councillor Moles, I, I think, I hope that was a rhetorical question, but um, in, just in case it wasn't, no, I don't think we should stop all town business, um, especially not for five years. I don't think the comprehensive plan committee is going to take five years to come out with a new plan. I do believe in listening to the citizens, and the citizens will be surveyed extensively um, for what their views on this subject, and um, so no, I'm not in favor of getting rid of the ordinance committee. But you're you. you're welcome to make a motion on that at any time you'd like to in the future. So, um, and it was a council vote uh, a couple months ago that that was included in that we would hold off for 18 months. So, you may want to refresh your memory in the minutes. I, I reserve my right to change my mind then. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jack. Just one comment uh, as far as the ordinance committee and, and changes. Part of the, when we just spoke of that, was that we would not be making changes unless they were time sensitive. And that's something that obviously there's going to be issues that are going to come up that we don't have the luxury of waiting on them. This one, I don't believe anybody has brought any evidence to us that it has to be done tonight, that it couldn't be done in another year when we have this information or other report has been completed. Okay. Thank you. Should we move the question? All those in favor of the proposed change? Three? Opposed? Three? And we have one recused, so the motion fails. Thank you very much to everyone for their time on this one. And Councillor Backer, you can return to the dais. <coughs> The next item that is on the table is a, is a series of items. I don't know if we want to um, take them up, sort of all at one, remove them from the table one at a time or all at once, but they are items 183 through 186. They all have to do with uh, regional waste systems, which is now going to be called ECO or ECO? ECO. 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 Okay. Um, so is there a motion to remove? Any or all of those from the table? So move. I'll move, I think, all of them together. 183 through 186. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of removing them from the table? Five. Opposed? Two. Okay. Um, they are removed from the table. Uh, we need. We, just for the information of the public, we, uh, previous to this meeting, we're having a workshop meeting out in the room, the conference room out back, um, on this and related subjects. And so the council was partway through questioning um, Councillor Fritz, who is our representative on RWS, and Kevin Roche, who is the general manager, who is joining us here tonight. So um, what, do I hear a motion on any of these? 
for, so that we can get going on discussion? The, to move that uh, we consider item 183-0405 and through 186-0405. Oh, okay. Okay, so 183 through 185. 183 through 185. Okay, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All. Hmm. Well, we're not going to go right to all in favor. Sorry. <laughs> that would move the I'm, meeting along. I'm really though. whipping along here. Um, discussion. Councillor Backer, you've been so patient. You were the next one in line out back to ask a question. And if I could now have the opportunity to ask a question or two of the RWS representative who has joined us for the meeting, that would be great. If I would you wouldn't appreciate mind, sir, coming to the podium so that people can hear you. Go ahead, Councilor Beck. Thank you. And although the council has had the pleasure of your introduction, perhaps for the benefit of the public, you can tell us again who you are and what your capacity is with RWS. Um, my name is Kevin Roach, and I'm the general manager for Regional Waste Systems, of which uh, Cape Elizabeth is an owner community. And we handle all of the solid waste and recyclable materials um, that are collected uh, and processed at, at uh, the transfer station here in Cape Elizabeth, as well as uh, 20, 27 other um, communities in the, uh, in the region. Thank you, Mr. Roach. Um, the agreements as presented to us assign voting percentages to each of the constituent member communities. And Cape Elizabeth is set at 5.11% based on, I guess, the volume of trash that we send to RWS. The last five years. Um, are those percentages fixed for the life of the agreement, or are those, well, are those to be readjusted on any annual or other frequency? I didn't see anything in the agreement that addressed that. The plan is that that would be a, that, that would be a fixed rate unless it was determined otherwise by the board who would have to take it to um, the owner communities. Okay. Um, and of the list of communities that we were provided with um, earlier this evening that have in fact approved the agreements, have they all approved the agreements as written or have uh, the agreements been modified in any way at the request of individual constituent member communities? No agreements have been modified uh, at this time. Are, have there been requests made by any of the communities to have the agreement changed for their benefit? Sure. Um, yes, there have been um, requests from other communities to change some of the language in the contracts. However, most of or a lot of the changes that have come to the table deal with the contracts as they stand today. Um, so you, you read the contract and some of the changes that have been brought forth, many of them actually, are the way the contracts are written in, in today's language um, and not so much uh, in the changes uh, foreseen for uh, EcoMaine, uh, which would be the new entity. Um, that would represent. However, there have been some specifically relating to how we bond for projects. And have you shared those requested changes with the town of Cape Elizabeth? Have we seen those by chance? We, uh, I have not shared them. The way we've handled that is that those towns that do have um, issues or problems with the um, language as it stands now have been asked to bring them to uh, the RWS board through their representatives so that we could deal with them at the board level. Um, and I anticipate that the, the board is actually going to be meeting um, on Thursday and we may hear from some feedback from some towns that uh, have chosen to do that. Could, could RWS share with Cape Elizabeth the changes that have been requested by various communities? Um, no change has been formally requested. Um, the only change that, uh, that uh, I'm aware of that, um, that may be requested in the future is the way that the organization um, actually bonds. 
And right now, in the documents, the documents uh, dictate, or basically the language is that uh, it would take a three-quarter majority vote by the full board to uh, bond for various projects. And um, there has been some talk that, you know, is that, is that an appropriate uh, measure? Um, but really, nothing's been brought formally um, to RWS. We've only, I've only heard, I've attended many of these meetings, and you know, I, hear, I have heard some of the, the issues or concerns. Again, most of the concerns that I have heard to date, uh, the far majority, are issues relating to the contracts as they stand today, without any change. Not, not contracts as they relate to the new contracts. But I have encouraged those, those folks to come, come forward um, to the board and, and express their concerns um, in that venue. Okay. Madam Chair, that's, those are all the questions I have. Okay. Thank you. More questions or comments or discussion? Okay. And the motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes. Discussion? Yes, discussion. Um, the only uh, comment I have, it's not a question for Kevin, is um, I will not be able to vote for this tonight. I think it's premature for us to vote on this. I won't make a motion to table. I don't want to cut off discussion at this point in time, but I personally think this should be tabled. With current alternative waste tipping fees at about half of what we are paying RWS, I think we are um, rushing into this if we vote on this tonight without finding out what our reasonable solid waste disposal alternatives are and what those costs are. I realize no one has a crystal ball and I'm not going to be holding the manager or anyone else accountable that those projections were wrong in 2014, but it seems to me we need to make our best um, guess at what the alternatives are for the town of Cape Elizabeth and what the cost will be and then we can start to assign some value to the certainty of RWS. I'm, frankly, I'm shocked that um, 12 of the 21 communities would sign um, these new agreements without that. Um, and I'm not persuaded that we should rush to approve these agreements tonight simply because 12 other communities haven't asked for that information. So I would hope that we would table this until we have additional information on the cost. It is after our personnel costs and our school costs, I think the single largest item in our municipal budget. And I'm not saying, saying I'm against this. I might well vote for this down the road, but I think we would be irresponsible to vote for it in the abs absence of some cost information. Council Moles. You know. Any other comments? Yes, I'd like to uh, say that I, I agree with Councilor Lynch. I think the uh, presentation that uh, Mr. Roach gave was excellent, very informative, but I think we need to look at all the information so that we can make an informed decision. <laughs> just Manager would like to make just want to make the, re the report that uh, Marianne's mentioned. I would hope that something could be ready for the September town council meeting. It'll give uh, you know, Kevin, a time frame when to expect to hear from us if, if you know, ultimately uh, there was a, uh, if the motion on the table didn't pass and you wanted to see it again, September would probably be workable. Council Roberts? The others have expressed uh, pretty much what I would say as well. Uh, and I would not be opposed to dealing with this at an, another council meeting. And I won't say that awful word either. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Fritz. I mean, we, um, we did have a very short workshop um, session, and I do think that dealing with waste issues are extremely complicated, and as um, suggested by Councillor Lynch, is a very big part of our budget. And I think it's an extremely important decision we have to make. I can, I can see that um, the Council is still grappling with the issue, it seems to me, I would certainly like to have another amount of time to look at some information, also to have uh, Kevin Roach come again 
um, to help us sort through some of these issues. I really don't think we got all the answers um, tonight because of time frame. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess I would, since I can count, um, <laughs> I, uh, don't, don't make a motion to table just until everyone has had a chance to okay. say, because once, once we move to table, there's no discussion. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but just to make sure. Okay. Councillor Backer, did you want to make a comment? Um, I would, thank you. Um, when we talk about, you know, opportunities for regionalism, waste disposal seems to be the most opportune um, way for us to economically and efficiently regionalize with all of our other member communities. And um, I am in complete favor of regionalizing waste disposal. I mean, I think it makes all the sense in the world. And to think that we, standing alone as a community, can find a more efficient way uh, to dispose of our waste is just hard for me to conceive of. Um, I agree, though, with what Councilor Lynch has said. I mean, there's no reason for us to rush into it tonight. I'd like to have more information, um, but my inclination is to approve the agreement as presented uh, because we are charting our future with all of the other communities that surround us here in southern Maine. We all have the same interest. We all have waste that needs to be disposed of. We all have an interest in doing it economically and efficiently and environmentally. And it's not as if regional waste systems is this entity that is sort of off on its own that we're signing into. We are that. Mm -hmm. entity and all of the other communities that are signing on to it with us are responsible for making the decisions for where regional waste systems goes in the future. So um, I'm, I, I will support the vote to table, table um, and obtain more information, but my inclination based on what I know at this point is to approve the agreements. Okay, we don't yet have a motion to table, but I'd just like to say that I um, am in full agreement with Councillor Lynch, just so everybody knows. So I think the whole council's in agreement um, that we should not be making uh, any firm decision on this at this point. And um, Councillor Moles, would you like to say something? Well, I just want to just agree with Councillor Backer that I, I too am in favor of regionalizing our waste disposal efforts, and I you know, realize that we'll, we will almost certainly be approving this at some later date. But because of the poor operation of RWS over the last decade, I think it's only honest that we hold RWS's feet to the fire and say, fine, but we would like to have this information. You know, it's, you need to build some trust back up with us that you're not going to continue to mishandle funds. Not that you're mishandling, but you know, I've, I've been in the industrial sector. I've operated boilers before, and you know, I've been on the RWS board as an alternate before, and I'm glad to see the great changes you're making and the good direction you're going in now. But uh, you know, as far as rebuilding that rapport with the towns, you need to give us this information before we sign on the dotted line. Yes. I, I just have to really make a comment. I mean, we had a complete study up and down that organization, and there was never any suggestion that any funds were ever mishandled. And, and I think that's a, I don't want that to be. Um, I didn't mean financially mishandled. I meant engineering wise over the last decade or so that it's not been run as efficiently as I've seen done in the industrial sector. The manager would like to make just comment. one other brief comment. When Kevin introduced himself, he introduced himself as the general manager, and he left off the word new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. laughs> He's doing an excellent job uh, figuring out what the various issues are at regional waste and uh, trying to move the agency forward. And I can congratulate him on what he's doing and thank him as well. Appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Yes, and we thank you for your um, all your information that you've provided and for your uh, bearing up so well under the, all these questions. Councillor so, Fritz, did you want to withdraw time. your motion? Well, I, yes, I, um, but I, I would like to make a comment. Um, I thought Councillor Backer said very well about 
the whole idea of our communities working together regionally and, and handling trash and recycling is, is the ultimate uh, uh, issue to be dealing regionally uh, with. Um, I fully support re-upping with, with RWS. Um, but, as I said before, I think I, I can see that the Council still is, is searching this whole issue through and needs more discussion. And um, so I'll withdraw the motion for this um, meeting and I'd like to table it to, um, I'm concerned that we don't have a workshop time between now and the September meeting. And I, I really think we need some more time in a workshop session with the general manager and, and able to answer all our questions and discuss it um, much more thoroughly. And so I'm thinking table till October, October. meeting uh, with a workshop scheduled in For September. September. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved that. and seconded. There's no discussion on tabling motions. All in favor of tabling this item until the October meeting, but having a workshop in September on it. It's unanimous. Great. Thank you. And thank you again, Mr. Roche. We appreciate your coming and being with us tonight and all the information you've provided. And I, I know I personally hear very good things about what you're doing at Regional Waste, now known as ECO. So thank you. Thank you. That was, those were items, the motion, I'm sorry, we didn't make that clear, but those were items 183 through 185. Should we catch him no, before? Okay. 183 through 185 that were t tabled uh, until a couple months from now because we hadn't yet taken 186 off the table. Councillor Lynch. Um, would it be in order at this time to um, move um, election um, or election of, one, of our representative to the RWS Board of Directors because we are still a member of RWS until Eco Maine is reconstituted. Okay, I guess I would nominate um, Councillor Fritz who has long been our expert on trash, recycling, reduction <laughs> and other waste matters. I'll second that motion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councillor Moles. I'd like to nominate Councillor Lynch as our representative to RWS. I, I Precisely was, because Councillor Fritz has been there so long. Uh, I think it's time for some new blood there. I, I, I would decline that at this point. Thank you, Councillor Lynch. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussions? All in favor? Six opposed, one. Okay. Thank you. And congratulations, Councillor Fritz, or condolences. <laughs> condolences. <or something>. condolences <laughs> or <laughs> a lot of meetings. Okay. We have another item that is still on the table from last time. It is item number 189, the land acquisition slash disposition policy. Um, we have a public hearing on it, but do we have to take it off the table first to have a public hearing on it? Uh, no, it's a new item number. It is? No, it's an old no it, was, it was tabled okay. from last time. So what's the procedure here? Do take we have to take it off first? So right. moved. It's been moved. Second. And seconded to take it off the table. All in favor of taking this item off the table? Six. Opposed? One. Um, it's now off the table. Um, this was an item uh, that the council was considering last month. It was um, initially, it initially came out of an idea that Councilor Roberts had, so I want to thank him for the initial idea, and I also want to thank Councilor Backer for doing his usual excellent job of wordsmithing it. I, in particular, also want to thank the town manager because he took a stab at merging together a whole bunch of different documents and um, pulled it together for us to consider in the first place. Um, this is basically, a, well, do you want to describe this at all? or Would you like me to? Go right ahead. Yeah, what, what this document does, it, it lays out 
if the if the town ever wanted to sell uh, any of its real estate uh, that it that it acquired either through a gift, municipal purchase, foreclosure, or or uh, through eminent domain, and it just goes through the different processes for each of uh, for how to acquire property and how to dis dis uh, dispose of it. It has a strong emphasis on uh, public participation, public notice, uh, and uh, you know quite an involved process in terms of making sure everyone knows that the town is considering selling a parcel uh, before the actual sale takes place. Copies of it were available in the, the back desk for anyone here tonight as well. Okay, great. Um, I should just make everyone aware there were two small wording changes um, from the initial draft we got. We got a, a separate draft tonight in our package. It just changed the title of two sections because of some typing errors. But um, Could you so, specify where those changes are? Sure. The title of section three, Roman numeral three, should be real estate disposition. So that was part of that was the email we got this afternoon. Yeah. Then late this afternoon. Yes. I okay. I didn't see. For, that's what I thought. Maybe people hadn't seen it. It's it but just that is consistent with what I have on my version. So the version you got in your packet said real uh, real estate disposition policy, and it just got rid of the word policy. There are several versions of this floating around. <laughs> okay. So the most recent version got rid of policy, and the only other change was the title of Section 3A was, or should be, foreclosed, vacant real estate, and residential real estate. The word vacant had been strict, stri stricken? Stricken out in, in error. <laughs> Struck out? <laughs> no. Red line. I don't know. I'm getting stricken here. So, Okay. Um, so that's what this matter is about. Uh, we did schedule uh, last um, month. We decided the council voted to have um, a public hearing tonight. So I'm declaring this public hearing open. If there's anyone who would like to speak on this matter, please come forward to the podium and state your name and address. I don't see much of a stampede. <laughs> the agenda doesn't say there's a public hearing. So does it? Doesn't it? it under item number 189 says it um, in tabling this item the council scheduled a public hearing for this council I'm meeting. just wondering if that would have stood out if the if public was interested and would have I don't know um, it's, is that the usual way of saying it? sometimes we do it was, it was I mean, the next one the next one says public hearing yeah. you know usually public hearings are, are for ordinances and you know this it was advertised for public hearing it indicates on the agenda that was mailed out to everyone that there'd be a public hearing yeah it, it has been publicized for two different council meetings now so so anyways public hearing I don't see anyone else coming up or anyone at all coming up so I'm declaring the public hearing closed okay do I hear a motion Jack you were the initial <laughs> idea person on this would you like to make a motion I didn't have that prepared but I believe I probably can I would move that item 189-0405 uh, our new land acquisition disposition policy as presented uh, on the draft received today be accepted and written into town policy. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Councilor Roberts. My reason for trying to bring this forward was on a number of occasions having citizens complain about the process of different parcels that we had sold and it seemed as though, even though each time we had done it, it was done with the best of intentions, there was no, there was no consistency. And I wanted to make sure that in, for any future issues of land being sold, properties being sold, or whatever, that there was a, a policy that was in writing, very consistent, and, that, and very understandable. The issues that I, and I had asked specifically that any parcel will be referred to the Conservation Commission for input on Greenbelt and open space concerns. Notice to all abutters uh, with an invitation to purchase if we were going to sell it. A public hearing be scheduled so that every, people in town realize that a piece of land was up for consideration to be sold. And that the council prior to making a final decision was uh, would be uh, required, if not all of them, at least the majority of councillors, to do a site visit so they knew exactly what it was that they were selling. Um, and that has all been put into this policy 
along with uh, standardizing the rest of the uh, areas that uh, the town managers put into it, and, and I, I, this meets all of my concerns, plus, plus, plus. I did not realize that we had so much stuff floating around there that could all be put into one document, so I would like to give the, the manager kudos on that as well. Thank you, and, and please accept our thanks. Any other comments or discussion? Councilor McKenney. I'd just like to make a comment that um, I think this is a really important policy, and, and I give the manager great credit, as well as Councillor Backer, for doing his, his work on this, and Councillor Roberts, because he came up with the idea. But it's really important because it's important for the citizens to understand we're really a full disclosure community. And in the past, I know there's there have been some concerns that uh, the council wasn't uh, fully informing the public about land sales and so forth. And it wasn't intentional, but it was because we didn't have a stated policy that was consistent. So I just, I just wanted to make that comment so that the public is aware that's why we're doing this. And we, we feel it's important that we fully disclose what's going on. And, you know, it's an open, an open discussion with the public. Thanks. Thank you. Any further comments, Councillor Fred? Just one uh, additional thing that I think is important in this policy, in addition to what Councillor Roberts said, because I, those are very important things, um, is that this really establishes that half the sale, half the, the proceeds after the costs of selling the land, um, half goes to the general fund and half goes to the land acquisition fund, which um, we hadn't been funding adequately in the past, and so I think that's an important. We've already put in some, I think, $230,000 in the land acquisition fund. So um, that's the important thing in this for me. Thank you. Cool. Other comments, cool. Councilor Moles. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have an uh, issue with two items in the uh, policy. Uh, the rest of the policy is written quite well, and I agree with Councillors Roberts, McKinney, and Fritz. However, under section, under section 3C, part 1B, which is the, well, it's about the middle of the packet. The first, the first uh, sentence on the top of the page says the town may sell. Under Section 1B, it says that we have to give the Conservation Commission a full 45 calendar days to make a recommendation to the Town Council and that we can't commence the bid process until after that 45-day period has lapsed. I don't see why that's so long. You know, why can't that be 30 days? I think 45 days is excessive um, and, again, I'm not in favor of giving the Conservation Commission you know, so much power. Uh, as, as the council, we are the decision-making body in the town, and although we do value their opinion, do we need to hold up the town for 45 days before we even start the bid process, you know, waiting for them to comment on something? The other issue I have is in Section 1F below, where the uh, bid process, when we send it out to bid, that we only give um, 14 days for people to respond to the bid. Uh, I think that is too short. That should be 30 days. Uh, not everyone is watching everything the town does at every minute. Not everyone's, you know, seeing the, the Cape Courier, which comes out at a, you know, once every couple weeks schedule. 30 days would at least give people a little bit more chance to, to see what's up for sale. And, you know, so between the, the time the Conservation Commission has had to look at it and between the time the bid process is actually opening, I'm not actually suggesting that we change the aggregate amount of time, but I think it should be shortened from 45 to 30 days on the Conservation Commission and increased from 14 days to either four weeks or 30 days for the bid process. That's my feelings on it. Councilor Fritz. I'm assuming that the 45 days for the Conservation Commission is because we might make a decision we'd like to hear from them or have a parcel that we're considering, and then their meeting isn't for, their, their scheduled meeting isn't for another month, since they meet only once a month. 
that, that's my assumption, and the manager would have something else. I wouldn't be opposed to increasing the amount of time people have to bid. Councilor Backer. Um, I mean, I think Councilor Moles' points are well made, but I think that both times as listed are are okay. Um, I mean, I think the idea of the 45 days and whether it was 45 days to the Conserva Conservation Commission or whether it was 45 days to uh, other town staff and the water district um, or anybody else, it doesn't really matter. I think the idea is that there's no reason for the town to be rushed into selling any parcel of real estate that it owns. And to the contrary, um, the sale of town-owned real estate should not be considered an impetuous action. That it's something that should be done deliberatively. Uh, once it's sold, it's gone. Um, and I think that the more input we get and the more time that's available for input, the better. I mean, I can't imagine a circumstance where there will be some compelling need for us to sell town-owned real estate on some timeline less than 45 days. Um, with regard to the time for bidders, the 15, 14 days, I mean, once, once we start, once we've identified a parcel of real estate for potential sale, and notice has gone out to the Conservation Commission and the Water District, it's out there, and that information is out there in the public domain. It's not as if bidders are only going to have 14 days knowledge that this is something that's under consideration. The fact that the town is considering the sale of the real estate will have been in the public domain for at least 45 days, even before the bid process starts. So anybody who has an interest will have had not just 14 days, but they will have had an additional 45 days to do their own due diligence and background investigation to gear up for the possibility of a bid. I don't see it as too short. Councilor Moles. Regarding Councilor Fritz's comments, I can understand that. I can understand that if the Conservation Commission, if we happen to miss their, you know, their meeting date, that they might need uh, additional time. Uh, you know, so whether it's, you know, I just, you know, didn't see 45. 45 just seemed excessive. But, you know, whether it's 30 or 45 isn't a huge factor. However, I do think that being in the finance business and working with a lot of commercial entities, I can see how much time it sometimes takes for someone to do their due diligence on a parcel, line up their financing, because they wouldn't want to make a bid and not be able to follow through with financing. Uh, and you don't simply want those people that have a big bank account that can just write a check to be the only ones able to buy uh, land. So I, I think it's 30 days is the appropriate amount of time to give people to look at it during the bid process, pull their financing together. Uh, as you said, we're in no hurry to sell the property. You can't conceive of a time when we'd be in a hurry to sell the property, and that would ensure that we would be selling it to someone who has all their ducks in a row, has their financing in place. Um, so. so I would like to ask that we amend Section 3C1F to say 30s instead of 14 days and leaving the other section alone, the 45 days alone. Uh, does the amendment need a second? I would second his amendment. The amendment to the motion. So you were making an amendment to the motion, right? Yes, and I second his second. amendment. Okay. Any discussion on the amendment? <laughs> I would consider it a friendly amendment unless, but I'd like to hear from the town manager if that, if there's some reason why that particular bid per, is consistent with other areas of things that we do, if that's why I use that t number, or if it's, and if there's just, we're just pulled out of the air, then the 30 days is fine by me. It doesn't, whatever date the council wants, it's, it's fine. It's fine. You know, the, the, my guess is, you know, these things are going to go on for about a year in terms of the debate and discussion from this point on. And it's going to, you know, one reason it was only 14, it's going to be so widely known that the town's thinking of selling lots, you know, when you get discussion and all the notices to the abutters and all that, usually those are the interested parties. 
going to be widely advertised in all those print newspapers and on the website. Uh, you know, it, it, at that point, once it is, I, I think 14, one, at one, that point, the decision is made to sell it. You know, let's get on with it and see what the results are. But, you know, it doesn't matter, 30, 14. Yes, Councillor Backer. Um, I'll, I'll support the change from 14 to 30 days, but there's, a, there's another place in the policy where there should be a similar change. Could you, could you under, point out section by section where we're... Under section 3A... Page 5D, <laughs> which is on page 4, <laughs> right in the middle of the page. It's, uh, there's a similar 14-day provision that, for consistency, I think we ought to change to 30 I'm days. I'm looking at I'm D, looking at a different... Just above where it says B, foreclosed commercial real estate. I think uh, ju I yeah, just, ab right. just above I paragraph B, foreclosed commercial real estate. Could you, could you say that section again, David, because we're all looking at different drafts. Oh, that's now uh -huh. section F. Yeah. We, we, we're, I'm looking at the draft we just got tonight. Well, let me look at that draft. <laughs> Hang on while we figure this out. Right here. It's, um, it's on page four of the draft you received tonight, and oh, it's, yeah. it's Three, section 3A5D. Wait a minute. That one. I'm looking at sub F. Um, it's, it's the a. draft that at the top is labeled July 11. I'm, I'm lost, but... Can we, <laughs> it's, it's just... We, we got a new draft in the, in the packet okay. tonight. Okay. And I think people are looking at... The one that came in the package yep. That's earlier. Good. I'm looking you know, at my homework yep. package. The staff will consider the amendment being made relative to all, all final bids in this process will be 30 and not 14. Okay. Does that take care of it? Yeah, there are just two places. Because it, just in case there's a third. Yeah, it right. could be. Wait, this okay. Is, yeah. There you go. Nice hand over. So we'll, we'll, move we'll, we'll move the amendment for changing the 14 the reference to 14 days to 30 days, wherever it's referred to in the various sections on whichever pages they are. Okay, all in favor of that? One, two, three, four, five. It's unanimous. Okay. So that was the amendment to change it to 30 days. Now, is there any further discussion on approving the policy with the change as made? No. All in favor of the policy? One, two, three, seven. Thank you very much. It's unanimous. And again, I want to thank Councillor Roberts for his initial idea, and Councillor Backer and the manager for their hard work on the draft. And I assume we will get a final, final, <laughs> final draft um, so we can throw out all our interim drafts. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. That takes care of everything that was on the table. Now we're on to new business. Item number 1940405 is a public hearing on an ordinance that has to do with coastal waters and harbors. Um, just as an introduction, Jack, would you like to say something about I that? would uh, defer to Councillor Backer on this, who acted as the chair for that particular meeting since I was out of town on that date. And I know David outlined what happened very well last month, so I'm sure he can do it again. <laughs> well, I'm not sure I can, <laughs> but I, I'll try. This, uh, the changes in this, the coastal waters and ordinance were brought to the proposed changes were brought to the council's attention by our new harbor master, Robert, um, um, uh, Mr. Long. Um, is he here tonight? Roger. Yeah. Roger Long. Um, and Mr. Long, to his credit, um, took a look at what was an old, somewhat neglected ordinance and, you know, with a sharp eye to what conflicted with good practice, suggested a number of changes uh, to the ordinance that the ordinance committee reviewed with him. 
um, and are incorporated into the draft that we have in front of us. Um, and I think that one of the primary changes in the ordinance that would affect people who have moorings in Cape Elizabeth is that mooring permits would need to be renewed on an annual basis as opposed to a, I think which was biannual, is that right? Um, and the ordinance also gives the harbor master broader authority to remove, and our new harbor master, Roger, I'm going to We'll let you give you editorial discretion here to jump in if I misstate this. Uh, to remove the ground tackle um, if he consider, considers the a hazard um, and the uh, mooring has not been used for a period of time. And I think the other big change in here is that the ordinance uh, creates actually broader authority for people to anchor in Cape Elizabeth without permits for extended periods of time. Is that a correct statement? Um, yeah, because it's out of business to kind of regulate people. Excuse, excuse me, could you just come to the podium so people watching on TV could And I'm and going and from, from a month's old memory on this, but. Well, the. Um, Right now, the ordinance says that if anyone anchors for more than 24 hours, they have to call the harbor master and get permission. Well, people just passing by, you know, if they get fogged in, you very often can get fogged in and stop and seal code for two or three days. And it doesn't seem to make sense to me that we should be making them violators of a town ordinance when they may not even realize that they're in a town. <laughs> and since the town doesn't provide me with a boat and I'm not a patrolling harbor master, it makes even less sense. <clears throat> we are leaving though a provision that if somebody should set up should anchor permanently in front of somebody's house and have loud parties become a nuisance, we do have the authority to go to them if there's a complaint and say we'd like you to move somewhere else. Thank you. I, I think those are the major items. Okay, great. I think we'll have the public hearing to see if anybody wants to give us any input on this, but Mr. Long, if you could just, you might want to just park yourself there in case <laughs> the council has, uh, moor yourself there in case the council has any questions. Um, I'll declare this public hearing open. If there's anyone who would like to speak on this uh, proposed ordinance change, please come forward. No one's coming forward, so I declare the public hearing closed. Um, is there a motion on this from the council? I make a motion that we accept the item 1940405 and we um, ex uh, change, adopt the new Coastal Waters and Harbors Ordinance. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion or are there questions for Mr. Long? I have one Councilman comment Penny. to make. I think the new Harbor Master has done an outstanding job in taking an old ordinance and making it very reasonable and rational and uh, enforceable. So, great. great job. And on behalf of the Council and the people of Cape Elizabeth, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Long. You've brought um, some real uh, professionalism and pulled together some good ideas for this and we appreciate it. Um, Council Fritz. I guess I'm, um, I just want to be clear on now with the new ordinance, um, you would only have to get a permit for Kettle Coal and um, Maiden Coal. Is that right? Maiden Coal. No, um, we were referring to before was anchoring, which is different than mooring. A mooring is oh, a, okay. it, the distinction is if the vessel, if, if, if it's an anchor that the vessel picks up and carries with it in the course of its normal navigation, then it's an anchor and no permit is required. But if it's an anchor that you have another vessel take out that becomes a semi-permanent fixture that you use to put a boat on, then it's a mooring because it occupies a permanent part of the bottom, which is a public resource. Okay, so we, if the, you would still have to get a permit for mooring in all of the coves, Angel Cove, Cliff House. Anywhere in town waters, if you okay. put in something in permanently that is used to hook a vessel up to, you need a permit. Okay, thank you, that's fair. Any more questions or discussion? 
Let's move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Long. Madam Chair, if I could just note also that um, our police chief, Neil Williams, uh, yes. also helped us, you know, walk through this ordinance and provided good input. And I want to thank him for the time he spent in helping us craft what we just approved tonight. Great. So noted. Thank you very much, Chief Williams. Okay, the next item is item number 1950405, school project funds. Um, either the manager, or would you like to introduce this? I'll do, I'll do a brief introduction. The uh, council's received a communication from Elaine Maloney, who is there, who is the chairman of the school building committee, uh, asking that a balance of approximately $130,000 left from the Pond Cove project be transferred to the high school project. Uh, the high school projects did go out to the voters. It was optional that they went out, that it went out to the voters. The voters approved each project by about a 70% margin. Uh, in the high school project in particular, uh, there was concern at the time that it was about to go out to bid that maybe the bids were going to, going to come in high uh, through, the, through the construction manager. It, it ended up they, they came in okay, but a lot of things had been deferred along the way uh, that the council saw this evening, the, the auditorium and the, some things in the library and some other things. And, you know, the high school project's gone well, but there have been a number of issues that have come along that they've had to spend contingency on, uh, including the road that needed to be reconstructed and uh, a few other things as well. Uh, you know, I think it's important when you open up a building and you get a lot of, when you're doing a lot of work, you go in and as much as possible you complete the job while there is all the disturbance and activity. It's, it's tougher to go back, you know, at the very end to do it. I, I think the, the building committee uh, has really made a, an excellent recommendation uh, because, it, you know, if anyone's been, particularly in the auditorium, which is what this will probably most affect, uh, you know, it was built 35 years ago now and is uh, really getting old and tired and uh, you know, I think you probably need wider seats now than you did back when it was done for <laughs> high school students. But, uh, you know, it's just so many different things that, uh, you know, could be accomplished uh, with the transfer of these funds. I, I really want to praise the building committee, the high school administration, Bob Lyman, the, the uh, interim superintendent, uh, Alan Hawkins is starting to get his arms around it, and Ernie and uh, others who have worked on the project, uh, Peyton Construction. It's really going well as the council saw tonight. and. Uh, I, I think it's important that uh, while the building's under construction, uh, that uh, we go in there and get the work done uh, that really needs to be done. Thank you very much. Um, is there a motion? I would like to move um, that the remaining balance in the kindergarten building account be transferred to the high school building account. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there discussion? Councilor McKinney? I just want to say that uh, we had a tour of the high school uh, earlier this evening, and it was very clear to the council members uh, present and others that were present that uh, the school staff and the construction team are doing an outstanding job, and some of the items that won't be done without additional funds transferred were, are really essential items that were first included in the uh, project. They're not additional items. They're basic items that we need for the students and for the benefit of having a quality school. I just think that's really important that the public understands that. Thank you. Council Lynch? Uh, I, just, I just want to make sure that the public also understands that these are not additional funds. The public authorized $7.9 million, and this is money that, um, fortunately, um, the Pond Cove came in under. So it is not additional to what the voters approved. It is within the 7.9 million approved by the voters. Any other comments? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. I want to thank the building committee and uh, Elaine Maloney and the new superintendent and everybody else who's been working on this project. We uh, were very impressed by what we saw this afternoon and the high school is going to be just great and just what this community wants for its children. So thank you.
Would it be appropriate um, to ask Alan to come take a bow? I don't think he's been, been, been before the council before, and <laughs> people may not watch the school board meetings that might watch a council meeting, and so we can officially up. welcome him uh, at a meeting. Come on up and let yourself be seen, Superintendent. <laughs> I'd evening. love to put people on the spot, Alan. That's, that's all right. Good evening. Thank you very much. Uh, I am the new superintendent. I'm going to take that title, Mike, for tonight, because I know <laughs> how quickly you can become the old superintendent. <laughs> so I just want to take advantage of that. I, I would like to di just take a couple of minutes while you've got me up here to thank you, uh, number one, for coming over this afternoon. Uh, it's very nice to see the town manager and all members of the council there at one time as we toured the building. Uh, I think you're right. It's, uh, it's new to me. I've been there three times, and each time it has changed tremendously. What I find is very interesting is when you go in during the day when they're working, I compare it to an anthill because there are people all over the place. They all know what they're doing and they're getting the job done. But I think from the perspective of Jeff as the principal there, I, you walk around the building and you think uh, there's just six more weeks uh, that we're supposed to be at an end point and we're hoping we'll be there, but I have every confidence that we will make it. But I would like to also take a moment to thank Jeff for the presentation that he did today because it was excellent. Uh, he moved us through quickly. The town manager kept moving us along too, but it was, a, it was an excellent opportunity to see the building. So I'd like to thank you tonight for your vote because it will make a difference. And I really appreciate your comments about the fact that add-ons and, and alternates are not things that we're looking for to make a dream school, but they are the things that were originally dropped and need to be picked up again in order to complete the work. And so I really appreciate your vote tonight, and we'll move on from there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, and once more, welcome. The next item also has to do uh, with the high school. It is item number 196.0405. has to do um, with a request from a local citizen group um, to provide lights for the high school athletic field. Is there someone here? Yeah, there are lots of representatives here, but as they're coming up, related to their point, I would like to indicate that on this item, uh, we sent out nearly 200 notices to all of Elizabeth Park, to Grover Road, to this far end of Fowler Road, to uh, the section all abutting the high school on, uh, on Old Ocean, on Ocean House Road, excuse me. Uh, we sent almost 200 notices to citizens indicating that this item would be on tonight's agenda, we invited them to send emails, invited them to send letters, and also let them know that there'd probably be an opportunity for them to speak on this issue as well tonight. So, uh, you know, so I know oftentimes the council is concerned about was there public notice, is there public notice. In this extent, there, was, there were nearly 200 uh, notices went out. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Jim Croft, and I'm from 56 Stonegate Road. And I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the committee that's been formed to upgrade the lighting at the uh, lower high school athletic fields. Um, currently, as you probably saw today, the fields are being renovated. They're being expanded to uh, uh, be able to accommodate varsity athletics. Um, but currently, the lighting that's on those fields um, operates at 30 candle power. In order for high school events to be sanctioned and held there, we need to move it to 50. Um, and so what the research that we've done, um, a company called Musco, and we have a representative here this evening to answer any technical questions, um, has done about 60 projects currently in the lighting of athletic and, and recreation fields in New England. Um, and they're proposing that we replace you currently have eight poles there now, and um, in, the, in the planned renovation, it moves it to 10. They're all wooden, and they uh, still will not provide the light that's necessary. The Musco proposal is to replace those with four metal poles um, and with increased and improved um, technology and efficiency, uh, we'll be able to raise those uh, with the four lights to uh, to, meet, to match the 60 or the 50 candle power that we would need to hold any athletic events, um, we're looking for this project to be entirely funded privately, and we have um, a five-year time frame that we're looking to finance that over. And we've looked at uh, financing can be done through Musco, through looking at local banks, um, through the U.S. Soccer Federation, 
and also through private financing. Um, we've also inquired with the National Guard in terms of uh, installation. Musco has worked with the National Guard on several installations around the state of Maine, and we're uh, pretty confident that they would entertain uh, installing this for us. The benefits that we would receive is that um, we would be able to host athletic events in the evening, uh, which would allow more parents an opportunity to see their children participate. Um, the lighting would be upgraded so that we'd have a, 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 a safer playing surface. Um, they'd be more en energy efficient and use less energy. And it would allow our teams that currently um, in the fall have a shorter practice period because of, of the uh, daylight hours to be able to practice um, and utilize the, the, the under playing conditions that they would be playing at at uh, other schools that would have evening games. And it would also, we believe, increase some school spirit um, and provide a, a venue for some, some evening activities at the high school. Uh, we're here tonight just to uh, let you know what we're what we've been looking at and researching. Um, we have made a presentation to the school board and they were in favor. And I think you've got a letter indicating that in your packet. Um, and we're hoping that with your approval, we'll, we'll be able to proceed to uh, the planning board process. Thank We'd you. like to entertain any questions. Thank you. Care? Um, what's, I have a number of questions. What, sure. um, what sports would it it would be primarily um, soccer, lacrosse, and field hockey. And so what what times of the year? That, that would be spring and fall. Soccer would be primarily in the fall, and um, lacrosse and field hockey would be, um, well, field hockey's in the field fall. Field hockey's fall. So. Lacrosse would be in the spring. And then how, how often would the lights be on? Would it be We're, daily or uh, in, in the afternoon or evening daily? Um, in terms of the fall, you may be looking at approximately a half an hour because you're going from practice, it would be a, a period of an hour and a half. Um, Mr. Weatherby could probably better answer that question, but the, in terms of game usage, you're looking at maybe a total of 14 times throughout the year. So for games, say 14 times. From those three sports. And then practice. Uh, Keith Weatherby, athletic director. Uh, what, what I would envision as far as practice is concerned, that it would. Uh, presently in the fall, without any lights, uh, we're pretty much done when we get into October around 6 o'clock or so forth. I could see that maybe giving us an additional hour to 7 o'clock where we get our practices. So 6 to 7 would be the time frame. Right. And for a game would be? The games would be, well, probably be finished at 9. So 7 to 9? Yes. Could, could I interject a question? You, um, Mr. Croft said 14 games. Is that, is that field currently, has it been um, used for night games at all? I don't know what the situation it hasn't, is. It hasn't for a number of years. It, it, originally that field was used for night games, yes. But over the past few years it has not been used for night games basically because the lights are not up to quality. So in the fall it would be approximately 14 yeah, Most of it would be evenings. 14, yes. Um, and that includes both soccer and field hockey? Right. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Carol, go ahead. Um, how, how does the National Guard help with setting these up? I mean, wh how does that fit? <laughs> uh, they do it as a project. Mm -hmm. So they um, basically do the entire installation of, of the lighting system. Musco would deliver the equipment, um, and the team of engineering people from the National Guard would do the installation. Um, most of that would be paid for through the National Guard. It would not be an expense that we would bear. 
I mean, is that considered training by the National Guard? Yes. Or? Yeah. What it is, if I may. Sure. Um, they, there's an engineer unit, and what that means is they're constructors. They build things. And they're equipped and trained to build things, and they need projects to work on. So oftentimes they'll do public projects during the year when they're not doing other, um, other type of training. So it's not unusual for them to volunteer if they're asked by a community organization to help out. It's good training for the, for the unit, and it helps the community. Mm -hmm. What do you estimate the cost of the materials to be? The uh, cost of the lighting equipment would run roughly $73,000. Um, there would be additional costs that uh, we would incur with the uh, installation for concrete, etc. cetera. Um, and we're also looking at uh, the possibility of erecting on the one end that faces the, the wetlands where it goes right into no man's land, um, on, on two poles with netting that for games you would erect to, so the balls wouldn't be going off. Um, so that the, the, a ballpark estimate at the moment is around $100,000 is what we were looking to raise. Other questions? Um, Councilor Lynch? Yeah, um, that $100,000 cost, you talked about um, various ways to finance it. Who would be the contracting parties for the financing of that? Well, we would be using the 501C3 uh, group that has a, uh, uh, with the um, Casco Bay Soccer, uh, and so we would, they, they would be handling the money for that. And they would be the ones signing the contract with Musco? Would that be the plan? Um, Probably. That's, you know, yeah, I, th this the citizens, you know, really, you know, the, the, we'd work that out administratively the, with the superintendent of schools, uh, you know, the, the, when the actual construction and other activities is issues of liability and we would work out those technical details in terms of uh, uh, how the money's transferred. You know, we, as a municipal entity, school entity, we'd be looking to make sure that before any work started, that uh, all the costs were covered so that it could be completed. Well, that's my in, concern, in keeping is that the, the money the promises. would be in place. Um, do you know what the electric bill would be? Um, if I can defer to Chris, maybe, from Musco. Good evening. Chris Sankey with Musco Lighting. The total KW consumption for the, the proposed lighting system is 56.2 KW. Okay. Using 10 cents a KW hour, it's okay. about five and a half dollars an hour to operate the lighting system, which doesn't include a demand fee, which uh, your local power company can. Sure, we can figure that out. Yeah. Okay, five and a half dollars an hour, you said. That's correct. Okay. Um, I have questions? a question for I, I guess the manager, um, since Maureen isn't here. Does the planning board have the authority to regulate? the number of games and maybe the time of that the lights would be on? Is that within their authority? Yes, they do. Okay. Other questions? Excuse me, Marianne, I, I wasn't sure. No, Are you done I'm with your sorry. list? I'm done. With okay. My... Councilor Moles? I was just, you were just looking and I was pointing. Oh, other <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Roberts. Thank you. Um, I'm very much in favor of having the lights there. I'd love to go to the high school games. And if they were evening games, I'm sure you'd see me there watching them. Uh, I do have a concern. I've seen poles and lights going up in other communities that then the people, once the poles are up, they walked away. So that would be one thing that I'd want to make sure that they were covered and the, and the city or the town, rather, and the, or the school department didn't get stuck with a, an unpaid <coughs> once, once the lights went up. Also, some of concern that the lights presently are not on down there very often, as far as I can tell. And with a, a good system like this, they would be on probably a lot more than people are expecting now. And, and that's not a bad thing. I'm not in that neighborhood. I don't think it's going to, if the up, uh, neighbors up above haven't complained, I don't think anybody else would. But 
if you got that, you're putting that kind of a cost in for the lighting, is it possible to charge a one or two dollar entry fee for people going into the games, or would they still go in free? I'm going to defer to Mr. Weatherby. It would, it would be possible to charge a fee, yes. Right. I'll better go with that. <laughs> Were there other questions down here, Councilor Fritz? Yeah, I was wondering about what sort of shielding these lights can have that would be back of the lights that so that they would not be right down onto the neighborhood right. but um, that's a that's a good question and there's two parts to that one is the actual lights themselves and they do have a shield and reflector and, and Chris can show you what that looks like and the second is that these lights are going to be better aimed at the field so that the drift that you currently have will be significantly reduced. And the the issue with the planning board is having 0.5 candle power within 50 feet of, of a property line. And these significantly uh, are well within that, um, not even close to being mm -hmm. in, in that situation. But Chris, if you wanted to talk about the shields. Sure. Each, each fixture on the proposed design that we have um, includes a, a visor, a spill and glare control visor. Um, the, the key to lighting an athletic field is to control as much light downward, um, controlling trespass light and controlling glare as well, both for players, spectators, and neighbors. Um, mounting height plays a key role in that, and fixture shielding does as well. The type of shielding that we're proposing on this design is, is recognized by uh, the IES, which is Illumination Engineering Society, uh, the IDA, which is the International Dark Skies Association, um, both very critical groups when it comes to outdoor recreational lighting. Um, and again, every fixture will have will have something on it. This this type of extreme spill glare control. Yes, is there a, a similar feel to the lighting that you're proposing that is nearby that um, we might be aware of? Yeah, there are several. That you have done. That yeah, we've done uh, we've done work at Colby College, Bates, um, Bowdoin College, Yarmouth High School, Falmouth, um, Noble, Wyndham, um, Marshwood, uh, Old Orchard Beach. There are several several facilities that we've done um, that will give you a wide range of of looks of what type of photometric technology are out there and we have different different levels the type of the level that we're proposing in this design is our most extreme it's the type of fixture extreme that you would, in what way? <laughs> well in, in, in a good way in, in, in a way that you would typically see near an observatory or major roadway an airport uh, anywhere where spill and glare control is, is a uh, is a is a premium and most of the projects that we do in the northeast because of landlocked facilities that we're always dealing with this issue I, I have a few questions too. What is the height? What would be the height of the poles, the new poles versus what they are now? The new poles are proposed to be 60 feet tall, the mounting height themselves. Um, I think we tried to estimate the existing poles at around 35 feet. Okay. So there'd be higher poles, but a, a smaller number of poles. Um, this may be a question more for Mr. Weatherby. What sort of attendance? Uh, would you expect at night games? Um, not several thousand. <laughs> uh, I, it would be hard to say. I would guess between maybe three and five hundred. And I'm just guessing. Okay. And um, so you said 14 night games. Is that 14 night games in the fall for soccer yeah. and field hockey? What about in the spring? Well, uh, presently there are 12 home lacrosse games, but I, I, I wouldn't think that all of them would be there. Sometime when we start in spring, it's pretty cold. Uh, I, if we did it in May, I would guess between six and eight lacrosse games. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think. I had another question. This is perhaps more question... Um, for the manager, I wanted to see if, I know Maureen is not here, the town planner is not here tonight, but to see if she had any concerns. And then I'd like to also know if public works or the police, public safety has any concerns about this. Uh, the town planner has, has met with representatives of the, uh, the group interested in putting the lights. 
she has explained to them the different standards that need to be followed as the representative of the lighting company has indicate they're prepared to follow the standards that the ordinance provides. So, you know, Maureen's concern extends to to the degree that it needs to meet the ordinance requirements. And I, you know, we haven't seen the application yet, but you know, as long as it meets the ordinance requirements, uh, which they've indicated they're going to do, her, her concerns would be fine. Uh, public works, I have not heard mention any particular uh, concerns or issues. You know, obviously you use the field a little bit more. If that one's used more extensively, there might be a little more wear and tear on it, but then there may be a little less wear and tear on some other field. Those are issues we deal with, with all the time. Uh, Neil Williams, Chief of Police, is here, and can speak for himself. But you know, obviously, nighttime activities uh, it can be there can be some issues. Then, uh, <laughs> you know, one thing we, we had a long discussion at the department head meeting on today is you know we, we talked a little bit about those issues. Uh, we also looked at you know what other communities in the region presently have lighting, and we we came up with the answer that they almost all do. Uh, uh, we're, we're very much the exception that we, we don't have night games, but you know, particularly you know, with the, the novelty of, of anything like this, the, there will be some individuals uh, who, who don't necessarily make mature decisions, and uh, that's something that will require uh, uh, some police activity uh, uh, for night games. Whereas you know, they you know, particularly initially, uh, until you know, it's identified if there are any problems. Uh, right now, uh, police only attend certain uh, events that they work out with uh, Mr. Weatherby in terms of, you know, where, you know, traditional rivalries of basketball games, that type of thing, or big events. Uh, and it's, it, it is expected that, uh, that there would be a little bit more police need uh, for some of these night games. Okay, I'm, I'm interested, and perhaps the chief would like to speak to this, um, I'm interested not just in safety concerns, well, although I'm interested in your opinion on that one, but also um, increased operating costs for the town if we had to have any more police officers or whatever at games. Yes, Neil Williams, police chief. Uh, we discussed that at department head meeting today. And uh, I feel that uh, at the first couple games, like uh, the town manager said, uh, we'd have to get a handle on it and have extra police duty down there at that particular time. And then we'd see how it went probably for the first year um, and, and see what type of, of activity was there at that particular time um, and what night it falls during the week. Sometimes that's uh, an event on a Friday night. It seems to be more popular than a Tuesday night. What's a four-hour overtime call-out? Right now, it is, it's $160. So per event, it'd be $160 charge that would be paid out of the athletic budget. That would be for one officer. Yeah, for one officer. Whereas that field down there would probably take two officers, I believe, at, at initially. It would take two. Yeah. So it'd I be, think one on either either end. So it'd be 320. Per, 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 uh, per four hours? Per four hours, that's correct. Okay, Jack? That plays into my question about whether or not they could charge fees to cover the, some of these extra costs that they don't currently have. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't really come out of the school budget. They could pay for themselves, mm -hmm. in, in, my opinion, in my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, any other questions or issues? Thank, thank you, Neil. One, once, this, oh, once this were the lighting were put in, I assume that if if there were problems with the neighborhood, or could it come back to the council to say, well, there are too many games being held there? Or? My suggestion would be it'd be something that'd be monitored by the school board. Uh, mm -hmm. They usually, the council usually, I wouldn't think would want to get involved in the the. Uh, the monitoring of that, and if you know if the individual councils had concerns, I could relate it to the school board. But I think ultimately, you know, the the day-to-day -day activities on the school grounds fall better within the purview of the school board than the council. Except when it comes to the money to carry for them. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Lamp, I'm just wondering if there is anyone else here from the public uh, on this issue. Yeah. Quite a few. The, is there? I, I mean, I, know, I see all the parents on the committee. I'm wondering if there are, is there's anyone from the neighborhood or? We did solicit, that was. I understood that. I just question. was wondering whether. We did solicit um, input and I think all I remember is we got one email 
Yeah, um, one email, and there was one gentleman here her, earlier this evening, I don't know what he was here for, but who everyone else, I figured more or less what they were here for. <laughs> is there anyone here, but this isn't a public hearing, but it, we've allowed the, um, committee. the uh, committee here to speak. Is there anyone here who has a different point of view or who would like, what? Or the school board. Or, or the school board. We can have Elaine Maloney come. But I want to make sure we hear from everybody who wants to say something on this issue. Yeah, my name's Elaine Maloney, and I'm just talking as a private citizen. Um, I'd just like to say that um, originally on the building committee, I know we had looked at a lights for the field, and it was an item that had to come off because um, we felt it would be um, an item that perhaps the public would not be comfortable funding at that time in a referendum. Um, so I wanted to thank this group for, for coming forth and, and, and looking at this as a proposal for our, our kids and also for adults who may play on those fields. Um, I know there are some adult teams and that there's an opportunity um, for some money to be made off of private groups that would use that field, which I know that you would probably be looking at as a revenue. Um, whether it come through the school or through the town. Um, I'd also like to note that it, having lights on fields does something for a community. Um, there are many communities that have these lights and they bring the community together in the evening when parents are out of work, when kids are out of school, where they can celebrate their achievements athletically. And um, it does build community and I think for that reason alone, you will find that the kids will come to that as a spectator um, and perhaps they won't be the places that um, people refer to them causing trouble or making poor choices. So in the long run, we may find that we need less police because there will be a lot of parents at these events um, and they will be chaperoned or looked after as a community. Um, so I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who been from the audience? Pardon me? I'm sorry, did you say? No, okay, is there anyone else from the audience here on this, okay. Um, I have one more question for Mr. Weatherby. Um, I know I sound, I keep asking about field hockey, but that's because both, it's the only sport I know much about. My daughter's <laughs> played it. Um, if it's going, if the field is gonna be used for both field hockey and soccer, is it the intent of the athletic department to stripe it for both uh, yes. games at, at once? You know, at any one time, it'll have sort of <clears throat> double sets of stripes. <coughs> Double sets of lines, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. We've, and we've, we've had to do that in the springtime for the uh, upper field when we played the uh, playoff games in boys and girls lacrosse. We've had different colored lines for boys and for girls lacrosse because their, their lines are different. So we could easily do it for uh, field hockey and soccer. Okay, great, thank you. My um, daughters have played at the field at Yarmouth under the lights and it's a fantastic, it's a different, the field is, different too, but the, the lights are great and it is really wonderful for parents and other interested community members to be able to go and see their kids um, play, the young people of their community play. So, anything? For a motion? Yes. Okay. I would like to move that the council approves the request of this group to go forward to the planning board. Light. Okay. I okay. second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Yeah. Anything else? Councillor Backer. I didn't have any questions, but I do want to make a comment. I, I read this proposal and I thought it was wonderful. Um, I think this is, has the potential to be a great addition for the town. Um, no surprise that there's not a whole lot for middle school or high school kids to do in this town once the sun goes down. And I realize that there is always the opportunity for mischief when you have a couple hundred kids together at night, including those from rival schools. But still, I think that if we can create opportunities for kids uh, to do things at night, especially on the school grounds where there's supervision, that it's a great opportunity. So um, I commend the citizen group that is putting forth the effort to try and collect what seems to me to be a pretty big pot of money. So I'm excited about it, and I wish you all well, and I fully support this. Councilor Moles. I would like to ditto Councilor Backer's remarks and also add that not only is this a great way to build community on an evening, but in the regular course of the athletic schedules, 
because we're having to go to other fields that have lighting, I mean, we may now have to go out of town less often, especially in the evening. And those students that might be having to travel in the evening more often to other schools where they have lighted fields will now be staying at home here in, in town. So that's Great. another benefit for this. Thank you. Councilor McKinney. I, just li I would like to thank the uh, group that stepped forward to help. And I would also like to say that this is a great way to, uh, for the community to come together. We have a great resource. We're spending a lot of money on that field, and we have to maintain it. And this is, it's a, we ought to use it as much as we can, you know, get max utilization. So thanks very much. Councilor Fritz, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, I, I do think this is a great way for um, things to get done in the community is the private raising of money and, um, for good goals. I have to um, say when I read this proposal, I was very concerned about the neighborhood. I'm still apprehensive about the field being so close to a neighborhood. Um, but given that um, notice has gone out to so many people and we really didn't have anybody here complaining about it, um, I have to say I didn't, I didn't play field sports in high school, but I did get to play or march in the marching band on, on lighted fields. And it, it really is quite an experience, I think. So playing on them must be as well. Um, so I'll be supporting this. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm taken by um, Councillor Roberts' concerns about the extra fees for police and the electric bill. And I guess I'd like to make a motion to amend this that expenses be covered by fees. Um, I'm not sure who the fees are. Is it to the, the players, to the teams, to the sponsors? Uh, um, to cover the cost of police and electric bill. Um, just two points on that. One, the, um, the, the lighting costs will probably be significantly less than they currently are. Because you're running eight lights, eight sets of lights that are terribly inefficient. Mm -hmm. So you're, we're projecting that the overall lighting costs will be significantly lower than they are now. You'll also have significant savings in, in maintenance as this goes forward. Um, the program as proposed by Musco has a 25 year guarantee in there for everything. So you're not looking at, you know, anything that happens in terms of lights burning out or repairs are covered by them for a 25 year period. Um, we currently are replacing those things as we, as we need them. Um, this project would also generate a, a savings because it, it qualifies the school as a green program within the central main power system. So we would be getting rebates because we're using energy efficient lighting. Jack. I did not intend to imply that we would tell the school department that they had to charge fees. If that, I didn't mean to convey that at all, but it's certainly an option that the school board would have. And if they felt that that was the appropriate way to fund these things, they should make that decision, not the council. I, I haven't yet heard a second for if that was an amendment to the motion. I haven't yet heard a second for oh. the amendment. So it, <laughs> is there a second for Councillor Fritz? Where do the where do the lights plug in? Do they plug in on the school budget School's side? Bill. Okay. Then the police would be on our side. Right. No. 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 Not we for school events. Charge. charge for we charge the school department for all police services. Hang on, before we keep okay, discussing this, this one, do we have a second for that amendment? I don't hear a second for that. So I think we're done with that little piece of the discussion. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying about yeah, the police. Done. You're done. The, 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 any use of the police on the school grounds uh, that they request, they reimburse. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Even sometimes I, when they don't request it. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with Councilor Roberts. I think that uh, this is a school board matter, and I think they will determine for themselves when and if they think fees are appropriate. So um, but that's just my, my humble opinion. So, um, Shall we move the question? All those in favor of sending this, uh, of authorizing them to take this to the planning board? It's unanimous, great. Just a, and I, 
technical, if I might. Yes. Any applications on town property are, are applications from the town. Oh. So while they'll, okay. they'll be involved fully in whatever, the town is officially the applicant. Okay. And I just would like to add um, my thoughts. This is a wonderful example of a public-private partnership, and um, I wish you every success. Feel free to put me on your list to, you know, solicit for a contribution. Thank I you for your support. Great cause. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Item number 197.0405, Library Trust Fund Use Authorization. I made a typo when I did the agenda. It should be the Marion Chase Fund and not the Marion Case Fund. I apologize to the Chase family. I didn't notice that. I think this is self-explanatory. This is the backup. <clears throat> Do I hear a most? I would recommend authorizing the use of $6,500 for shelving and furniture for the library. Um, with 3850 from the Marion Chase Fund and 2650 from the Barber Chase Fund. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I hear no discussion. I would like to thank, once more, thank the uh, Chase family for their generosity. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, item number 1980405, uh, which is, has to do with a grant for the regional tactical team. Do you want to introduce this? Yeah, this is this is something that a couple of our personnel work with the city of South Portland, and this outfits our sh our share of the cost of outfitting a couple of the Cape folks. It's very much a, a regional team, and uh, we're pleased that Cape Elizabeth works cooperatively with the city of South Portland on this regionalism once again. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion that we accept the um, grant for regional technical team for Cape Elizabeth of $5,173. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Does this require any matching funds at all? No. And what, what would the uses of this um, equipment be used for? I mean, it sounded SWAT-like. Yeah. <laughs> To me, I, I, I don't like the. Use. Uh, somehow, I don't have the impression that we need a SWAT team. It's for those field hockey here. games when the girls even if, get out of line. <laughs> even if other taxpayers are paying for it, this the fiscal conservative in me wants to know that we're really going to use this right. stuff. Chief Williams. To and for what purpose? To answer your first question, there is no match on this uh, particular grant. However, not all the equipment that we need. Um, is on this list either. Um, we applied for much more than this. However, uh, the grant only came through with this amount of equipment. Um, like the manager said, a while back uh, we looked, uh, being a small department, we can't field a, a tactical team, um, SWAT if you will, I just don't like that uh, terminology. But uh, it's sometimes you need to surround a, a perimeter and uh, contain a certain area. We don't have the personnel to do that. So um, what we did was we looked to, towards South Portland. They also needed a few extra members because you never know when you're going to get called out. And uh, not everybody on that particular team might be available. So what we did was we uh, did interviews and we uh, selected two officers to go along with South Portland's team and train. And it's worked out quite well. And what this equipment will or grant to buy this equipment, what that will do, it will help us buy light equipment. Therefore, um, when officers go to a certain uh, scenario or scene, then um, they will have the same equipment as South Portland. And I, I think it will work out quite well. Chief, this could be used if there were a chemical spill or something like that. Could some um, equipment be used then? Uh, respirators? Pri the respirators could, but primarily this is for a, a tactical situation where uh, a gas might be used. Uh, uh, you know, it could be a rescue situation where um, uh, the perpetrator used gas and, and it would allow the officers to get in and, um, okay. and, and do a rescue. You know, I think in answer to Mary Ann's question, too, we don't have that many of these incidents in Cape Elizabeth, but it really helps for us to be partnered with South Portland so our folks receive a little bit of training. And this clearly is the entree for when we get, if we did have a need, 
uh, we call South Portland in, and mm -hmm. you know we, we're part of we're part of the group. We are part of the training, and and you know it's understood that they need to provide the mutual aid uh, because we're part of the group. And we're also in conjunction with Scarborough. Say Scarborough had an incident, uh, the South Portland Cape Elizabeth team would be called in order to set up the outside perimeter while Scarborough did their function, and uh, vice versa. Scarborough would be called to set up the outside perimeter while um, we handled the situation. Um, we have been called out. Uh, lots of times that particular unit is used on felony drug arrests where they have to get into the building quickly and, and uh, one, protect evidence and two, protect uh, the people inside. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or Jack? Chief, are you able to identify the officers that are going to be able to do this? Um, right, yeah, right now we have Officer Gadet and Officer Fenton. Um, we're going to uh, send them to uh, more training. Great. It's a good opportunity for them. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay, let's move the question. All in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief. Okay. Next item is item 199.0405. Mike, carry forward balances. Just a, a note, there's, there's a, one revision from the one that was in your packet. It's proposed to also carry forward $9,600 for town hall windows. Those are the in the front tax office. What we discovered recently is, well, they were, they were in there working one day and one of the windows came crashing down. Uh, and we, it was, the windows have gotten such that <laughs> they couldn't open a single window in the whole office, uh, which doesn't work too well with, with air circulation and, and other factors. Uh, so anyway, uh, this, would re this replaces all of the windows that have been found to be inadequate uh, along the whole front of the building. And it also, though I didn't list it here specifically, it also, there was, there was an item that was in last year's budget that I thought was going to be done prior to the end of the year, but it was done over this past weekend, which are drop-down doors for security, and those have now been installed. It's 6,900 for the windows, the balances for the, there's a couple of thousands of drop-down doors, and then I threw in a couple extra hundred just in case I misguessed on something. Okay, do I hear a motion? I move that we approve the carry forward balances. Second. Then moved and seconded, is there discussion? All in favor? Uh, six. Okay. Opposed? One. Okay. Just Madam Chairman. Yes. Uh, we did receive in, in the mail today the Maine Municipal Association annual ballot for their election of offices. It's the, the nominated candidates, and it'd be nice if Cape Elizabeth cast its ballot. And, uh, uh, they, you know, Nick Mavadonis is in line to be the uh, president. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Pelletier, uh, Nick Mabadon is the <laughs> vice president. And, give Nick a promotion. Uh, Ann's term has expired and won't be continuing. Will, will expire. Huh? Will expire at the end of the year. And th this is her successor offices. So uh, Deb Cabana, and with the council's indulgence, uh, you know, I would like the council to consider to uh, take up an item out of order to uh, cast the ballot. <laughs> so moved. Second. You guys, you guys got it down to Venice? Okay. okay. There's no contested races. Right. Um, any discussion? Okay. All in favor? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yes, Councilor Backer. It, it, uh, Madam Chair, what role, what title do you currently hold? that you are retiring from? Uh, <laughs> retiring from. Executive. I am on the executive committee. I'm also chair of the strategic and finance committee for the main municipal. And system. you'll be continuing on the finance committee? Or? No, I will not because my term, in order to be on the finance committee, you have to be uh, on the executive committee and I will be termed out as of the end of this year. They have the term limits. Y you are turned out because of term limits? Termed out, yes. Okay. Yes. So it wouldn't help to uh, insist that you be a write-in candidate here? Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's very kind, but um, I, I'm not eligible. I don't, I'm not eligible. Would you like another post? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. But 
I, I feel I'm pretty busy in Cape Elizabeth at the moment. Councilor Moles. Why are they sending us a ballot with nothing contested? I mean, where, where, do, where do these names come from in the MMA process? Go for it, Mike. Uh, the main townsman had an, had an ad uh, a couple months ago, three months ago, inviting uh, anyone to be nominated. Uh, this is all they got. Well, I don't know. They, they had a nominating committee, and thank you for oh. asking me to clarify. They had a nominating <laughs> committee, and the nominating committee brought forward these recommendations. I, have, I do not have a clue of how many the, the names were suggested. And generally, I will say that you know, Cape Elizabeth has been fortunate to have two representatives on there in the last 20 years, uh, and uh, you know, it's unusual. It would be they're not likely to come back to Cape Elizabeth now for six or eight years. Uh, because I like to rotate it to yeah. other communities as well. If, if I could add, there is a nominating process. The, the way the president is nominated is, I mean, anybody can just apply, a former, you know, a municipal official, but um, the president, Ryan Pelletier is this year's vice president. He is sort of moving up to um, president. Nick Mavadonis, who is a counselor at the city of Portland, is now on the executive committee, um, and he was chosen by the nominating committee. I don't know how many people, it's a confidential process, I don't know how many people went through the nominating committee. Um, you can nominate yourself or be nominated by somebody else, but they, they interview people. Um, it's a three-person committee that is made up of municipal officials from across the state. And the, that same committee, which is chaired um, by the past president of MMA, um, chose these nominees for the executive committee, m the members, Stephen Eldridge, Jeannie Bellio, and Galen Larrabee. So. And, and the, there is a chance to contest, but it was prior yes. to now, yes. as a nominating mm -hmm. process that anyone can, any of the other candidates can challenge it. And part of what the nominating committee looks at is since it is a statewide organization, they look to try to have a balance between north and south, East and West, you know, geographic rural spread, urban. rural versus urban, service centers versus small towns, so on and so forth. And um, since I'm rotating off, they're trying to get somebody from Southern Maine, and I'm sure this person, who I don't know, from the town of Freeport counts as Southern Maine in their minds. You know, they, and they, they try to get sort of a spread. Well, I, I do know Jeannie Boyer from Freeport, and she will do a great job on great. that committee. She's a great woman. Um, I just wanted to raise the issue that, I mean, they don't even have a spot for a write-in candidate for president. It, was just, it just seems kind of very undemocratic if, the, if it was even supposed to be a democratic process. Well, the, the bylaws provide that the, you shouldn't even be on there. The bylaws provide that the vice president moves automatically. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They shouldn't have put it on the ballot. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we need to vote to suspend the rules. To, to consider this item because it wasn't oh, hard. Oh, well, I moved to suspend the rules. We moved that. First. I seconded. But we didn't. I thought you, you moved to to approve this. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you Anne is right. I did not move to take it out of order, but I'll move to take it out of order okay. and suspend the rules. Second. Okay. So, all in favor? I'm, was that a question or was that's that? That's all in favor. That's all in favor. <laughs> all in favor. Yes. <laughs> okay. It's unanimous. Now I'll okay. move this now, slate. Move um, slate. Move that we and seconded. All in favor? It's unanimous. Do you have the signature page, Mr. Bannon? Excuse me? Do you have the signature page? Who, uh, Carol, you seconded that? Yeah. Deborah wants to know. Now I'm wondering, can I move after citizens discussion of items not on the agenda, I would move that we go into executive session in accordance with 1 MRSA section 405 subsection 6D to discuss negotiations with the Cape Elizabeth Police Union. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, all in favor? Okay, we will do that. I will just mention before the cameras are turned off um, that the town council will hold a workshop on Thursday this Thursday, July 14th at 7.30 p.m. in the town council chamber on the proposal to grant an easement over Fort Williams Park. Um, I see no citizens out there except the assistant town manager. Um, so if 
There's no one here who would like to do the citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. We will move. Would. Oh, yeah, I, sorry. I, I hurried at, at the beginning. I had something else to bring up in the manager's report, but I didn't because we're in a hurry. Uh, at least I was in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> just as the council is aware, we're talking with the towns of Scarborough and the city of South Portland about regional dispatch. Remember, there was a grant that was received. Mm -hmm. Well, the they had a meeting uh, a couple weeks ago and agreed to hire an outfit called R RCC, I think is the name of it, that's, that's doing the study. They have prepared a survey, a questionnaire, for elected officials to fill out that's four pages long and it's about 50 questions. Uh, I apologize for the length of it. I can't believe that they asked something that's long. But I'm going to be distributing these to the council members and ask that you try to return it in, in a week or so. Uh, if you want to return in a sealed envelope, that's fine. Just put PSAP questionnaire. We'll forward it to the consultant, though. You can just send it in. But uh, uh, I apologize for the length. I, we had nothing to do with the length. But I did want to publicly mention that you'll be filling these out and that the process has begun. And like to, I, I, I know this is, I can't believe how long this is, but uh, I appreciate any of you that are willing to fill it out. OK, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and yes, Councilor Moles. Again, because we were anticipating such a long evening, I didn't want to make a uh, announcement at the beginning of the meeting. But as we're wrapping up, I, I did want to say that we had a very nice, very successful family fun day this year. Unfortunately, it was too wet for the fireworks. And we'll be looking forward to a drier day next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I would also mention, just as a notice for anybody who might be watching, and as a reminder to the councillors, I hope everyone got this notice of the caucus, the District 2 Budget Advisory Committee, for uh, the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee. Um, they're having their meeting uh, for District Number 2 on Tuesday, July 19th at 7 p.m. at the conference room at the Scarborough Town Library. Um, Mike Moles has been serving as a member of that Budget Advisory Committee this past year. Um, I don't know if you're interested in continuing in doing that? Yes. Okay. In fact, I'm going to run for chairman of the BAC this year. Okay. Well, then we better make sure you get elected to the, so. to the committee. It's important, be, the people who go to this meeting, which is not usually very well attended, elect the people who are on the committee. So anyone who can go, I would encourage you to go. It's usually a pretty short meeting. Um, but I've been to some of these meetings when they only had four or five people there. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that and wish Council and, Moles And the luck. more representatives we get from Cape Elizabeth at the meeting, the more votes we get at right. the meeting. It's one, you saying you'll pick me up one Tuesday? I think I'm already, my, I don't think my term's expired yet. I think I'm a shoe in But if there's an opening, okay. we may want to fill it with someone local. It's one attendee, one vote. So if there's anybody else who's interested in also being on. We have had two representatives at yes. on page. Henry was on. Yeah. Yes. Henry and Councilor Ginty was too. So, so good. try for two. So think about it. I just wanted to remind you. Um, OK, do we intend, we aren't intending on taking any no. votes? We aren't intending on taking any votes when we ret return to public session, but we will turn off the cameras because we'll be going back to the conference room. Thank you very much. No votes other than to adjourn. No votes other than to adjourn. Yes, thank you very much.